welcome again. Thank you for joining us a second time. We are thrilled to have you, like I said. Happy second week of Hispanic Heritage Month. And um, real quick, we're going to talk about translation. So Aurora, you are on. Muy buenas tardes. Uh, bienvenidos a este seminario de lo Adelante Latinos. Tenemos el placer de tener y estamos muy emocionados de tener al señor David Heredia, eh, que nos va a platicar acerca de su carrera y eh, de su caminar en el arte como ilustrador y empresario. Si necesita traducción, esta es el segun, la segunda semana de la serie de pláticas que tendremos con motivo de la herencia hispana. Si necesita traducción, por favor haga clic en el icono de interpretación y seleccione español. Gracias. Thank you, Aurora. And now we are going to, I want to say a couple thank yous. Uh, first and foremost to our speakers in the series that we're going to have and those who introduced us to our speakers. So Beatrice Bautista, Ivan Quinones, Anita Quinones Gabrielian, Jenny Quinones Skinner. It looks like they're in all the same family. They're not. Those are three different Quinoneses. Um, but we are thankful for all of them. Bill Gallimore for organizing and being the tech guy in this whole production. Glendo Unified School District for helping us through this and partnering with us. Um, they are responsible for our translators, so we certainly appreciate that. And Glendo Latino Association for, for being a forever friend, a forever partner in all of our um, productions and uh, Glendale Public Libraries. They are partnering with us this year. So they are helping us out with this speaker series as well as Dia de los Muertos, more to come on that. And then of course, to all of my peoples um, in Adelante Latinos, our, our group and our student club, Sin Limite, um, Latinos Unidos um, and Amigos, we love you all. And our student moderators, Sammy Villasenor, Jesse Gusick, Sydney Esquivel and Michael Gonzalez. So we are really happy to have all of these kids involved with us. If you haven't already, please see us on social media. Our email address is there, our website, our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Please check us out, follow us. Um, we would love to have all of you um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be super duper, duper helpful. You can get all of our information here, our upcoming events, links to meeting, agendas, etc. And um, last week, I had the pleasure of interviewing Sammy Villasenor, one of our seniors, who's our student moderator tonight. And that recording is on YouTube on our channel. We have the, this is a link right here that you can um, use to see, but I'm sure if you Googie, Googie, sorry, Google or, or search on YouTube for um, that title right there, I'm sure you'll find our fascinating interview last week with Samantha. It's wonderful to hear from our students who are actually in our programs, who are actually growing up in Glendale. Such great feedback from them. Okay, and then this is our lineup for the next uh, three and a half weeks, four and a half weeks. Uh, Enrique v Enrique Nueva is this Wednesday. Then we have Dr. Ana Pantejo, Pantoja, Pantoja, sorry. Um, Silvio Lanzas, the fire department chief. After that, Roberto Alvarez and Roberto Negrete. And then finally, our, our final speaker is Dean Flores. So we are super excited to bring these politicians and doctors and fire chiefs um, to you and um, psychotherapists. And tonight we have an author and an am animator. And I have his book here. Let me turn off my video background real quick. I don't want to turn off my video. Hold on. I'm going to turn off my virtual background so that you can see the book. So we have here his book, Little Heroes of Color. I shared it with you all last week. Wonderful illustrations and examples for our students. We all know representation isn't everything, but representation is important. It is important for our kids to see people who look like them and act like them and talk like them and eat like them 
um, in our culture, in our everyday. Okay, um, so Sammy, is it, Mr. Gallimore, is it time to give it over to Sammy? I think so, right? Oh, first though, um, our next strategic planning meeting is Wednesday, November 3rd from six to eight. Um, we hope one day we'll be back in person, but for now we're gonna keep things on Zoom. So please join us. We have a lot of great plans for this year and I would love to see you there. And I'd love to have representation from all of our Glendale schools. So please, please join us. Okay, so here we go. My, this is Ms. Villasenor. I'm gonna hand it over to you and thank you all. Hello everyone. So David Heredia is an award-winning animator, author, and entrepreneur. His company, Edwards of Color, um, LLC has been featured in New York Times, NPR, Spectrum News, and PBS Online. His long-term commitment to educating through art has led to new has led to the new creation of his book, Little Heroes of Color, and a series of virtual workshops celebrating trailblazers of color. And an in-demand speaker, David, has delivered diversity training for Walt Disney Company and art and business workshops at Cal Art, Merriman School, Berkeley Hall School, Friends Seminary School, Cal State Fullerton, School of Visual Arts, as well as at film festivals across the nation. Little Heroes of Color and his book, The Freelance Hustle, self-published in 2020, were both number one hot new releases on Amazon. Am I up yet? And now introducing Senor Heredia. Hey everybody, uh, I'm so, so delighted to be here today with you. Um, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Bill. Um, this has been an incredible journey, my art journey. It's still going on, it's not over yet. Um, but since they told me the theme was hope, I thought it would be fitting to share with you my career from the year 2002 to the year 2000, uh, 2020. Um, and I stopped it there just because, you know, we can talk all day on this thing, on this journey, this art career. Um, but one of the things that I, I really wanted to stress was my art career taught me a lot of things, most of which things never go as planned. Oftentimes we have in our mind, you know, I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna graduate, gonna get a great job and everything's gonna be beautiful. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. And found, and you know, what I'm grateful for is all of the choices that I made. I made a lot of bad choices, but those mistakes, those big mistakes that I made ended up being the best thing ever happened to me. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna show you a visual journey of what my art career looked like. Uh, it says my screen sharing capabilities are not working. Um, so if you can give me access to that, that would be fabulous. I mean, I can talk you through it, but I don't think you'd be as entertained. Mr. Gallimore, do we have that ability? To. I'm not, I'm not able to screen share. Fixed. Sorry, go ahead. There we go. Okay. And David, real quick. Yeah. Before you get going, if there are questions, um, please add them to the Q and A, and Sammy will answer the, or she'll ask those. She won't answer them. She'll ask them at the end. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. All right, so let's get started. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this board game called, um, I think it's called the Game of Life. So I wanted to use the same theme and navigate kind of like a board game. You know, the great decisions and the not so great decisions that happened in my career. 
Um, so we're starting off in the year 2002. I had just graduated from the School of Visual Arts in New York, majored in animation. And while I was going to school, I two times flew out to California and um, did an internship at Warner Brothers, was one of the companies that I worked in. Struck up a great you know, relationship with some of the directors. And they said, hey, look, you know what? When you graduate, keep in touch because we can help you find a job. So I was like, say no more. You know, June 2002 rolls around. I graduated and I got a call from Warner Brothers. Now, you have to understand, as an artist, as a young, young boy, my dream was to work for an animated, an animation studio. So whether it was Warner Brothers or Disney, just to be in the industry was huge for me. So imagine my surprise when they call me to tell me, we have a job for you. You just got to get out here right away. So I did just that. Packed my stuff, quit my job. Um, my mother was mad at me. She didn't talk to me for a little bit after I did that. Um, but I moved out to Los Angeles and I sit down, you know, I can't even like, I don't even think I slept that night. I was so excited. Go to the interview the next day and the the, the man, I remember the director was making small talk and like he wasn't talking to me about the job. And finally I'm like, talk to me about this position. Like what exactly will my role be? And he tells me, unfortunately we don't have a job. <laughs> He's like, uh, I think you misunderstood me. I never said I have a job. I said, if I have a job, I would recommend you for it. Now. I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I misunderstood this. You knew I was coming from New York. You knew that in order for, I don't know anybody in LA. So like, what am I supposed to do now? And he thought, he's like, wait, did you just fly out here just for this? I'm like, yes, you told me I had a job. So there I was, um, freshly graduated with no, now no job because I quit my job, nowhere to stay. Um, and as I'm walking out of his office, my mother calls me and my mother and I have an incredible relationship. And I felt like just such a disappointment to have to explain to her that she told me, don't, don't leave like that. You know, make sure you got things in writing, make sure everything is official. And I didn't, I just left. So she calls me and she's like, how did it go? And in that split second, I had to make a decision. Do I go back home or do I stay here in California and give it a shot? I'm already here. There's so I was surrounded by animation studios. So my thought was, if it's ever gonna happen for me, it's gonna happen right now. I don't have any children. I'm not married. I don't have any major bills. Why not give it a shot? So I told my mom, I'm like, you know what? It didn't work out, but I'm going to stay and I'm, I'll figure it out. So I ended up staying at the house of a friend that I met. I stayed there for about two months. While I was there, I got a job at Hollywood Video. It was one of the worst jobs I ever had in my life. Hated every minute of it. And while I was there, it was very difficult to hold my, like hide my emotions. And it was it was very apparent that I wasn't happy at that job. But I said, you know what? I'm here. I got to give it a shot. I can't give up. Got to keep going. And then finally, I was just like, you know what? I'm, I think I'm done. I am i don't I don't want to stay here anymore. It was only August. I had only been there for like two months, but it felt like I was there for about three years. And I made the decision to leave. I bought my plane ticket that week. That week that I bought the plane ticket, I got a call from Disney Animation. And they said, um, we're interested in interviewing you for this position. Now understand by this point, I was fed up with California. I didn't want to have nothing to do with California anymore, but I did want to check out the animation building. So I said, sure, I'll take the interview. Go to the interview and 
I sit down. Now, I'm just sharing this experience with you, but don't do not do what I'm about to share with you. Don't do this in a job interview. I sit down, I put my feet up on the table. I had my hands behind my head. I was looking around the office, you know, just checking it out, you know, real arrogant. And the only reason I was behaving that way was I already knew I was leaving. I had no intention of staying in California. So after the job interview was over, I walk out. I don't even make it to the parking lot and I get a phone call. I was like, oh, man. that was insane. That was completely unexpected. And so I ended up staying. I stayed in California for about four years. And uh, no, not in California. I stayed in working at Disney for about four years. And something happened though, while I was at Disney, there were a lot of things that were going on. Mostly, I started to discover what was really important to me because there were a lot of things that I was not able to do while I worked at Disney. For example, if you're a creative person, you want to do graphic design or whatever, illustration, if you work for an animation company, nine times out of 10, you are not able to draw or do any commission work for anybody anywhere else, even off hours, even on the weekend, like you're not allowed to draw anything. So I felt that at the beginning, like I could, I couldn't understand that, but you know what? I'm not able to move up in this company and they're not allowing me to grow outside of the company. So it just wasn't really working for me. You know, I was starting to have a lot of conflicting sort of ideas of what I should do. So I decided that I was gonna give them my two week notice. Um, now there, there was more to that story that I didn't share, but we only have 45 minutes together, so I can't get into it in detail, but um, suffice it to say that, that it was enough of a decision to make me want to leave. And one of the deciding factors was uh, during that month, um, I'm sorry, during July, 2006, I attended uh, the Comic-Con Festival in San Diego. And I was selling these multicultural posters from different countries, beautiful artwork that I created, and people were buying them. And they were just like, I just saw how people were reacting to this work. And it was one of the first times that I saw how much my work had an impact in the community, specifically the Latino community. I had never seen that before. I had never witnessed you know, a lot of times we create stuff, but we don't see how it affects, how it impacts people. So here I am seeing how excited these parents are. And they're like, wow, I can share this with my kids and we can have conversations about our culture and this and that. And I was like, man, this is like blowing my mind. So I truly believe that by holding on to my culture, I was able to allow other people to introduce their cultures to their families and their kids. And Disney wasn't cool with me doing this because again, like I said, it wasn't on their contract. Again, I, I totally get it. I decided to leave. Now, when I left, the first two months were absolutely beautiful. I mean, I sold shirts, I sold prints, I sold, you name it, I sold it. And I felt really proud of myself because I took that chance in investing in me, right? Because I felt like the plans that I have for me are way better, way bigger than what anybody's gonna have for me. So unfortunately though, by January, I wasn't able to give away any artwork. <laughs> I wasn't making any sales. I couldn't get any clients. And I was really, really in a bad position. And I wondered to myself, how did I get here? How did this happen? And the one thing that I could think of, I made a very emotional decision. A lot of times we'll get upset with something or situation in our life and we react to it right away we react which means you don't really think clearly about it you just move that's what i did when i was at disney i reacted to all of the stuff that was happening i didn't take the time to really think of a plan so that's why i ended up here from february to april i ended up working at state farm now I'm not trying to smash State Farm. I'm sure it's a fantastic company. I hated it, but that was where I had to be because I 
couldn't work tracing. Um, I couldn't sell any of my stuff. It was just, a, and while I was working at State Farm, oh man, I got into so much trouble while I was there because my my mindset was completely off. I was just blaming the world for everything that was going wrong with the decisions that I made. And something interesting happened at State Farm. Three things happened. First of all, if you get written up three times in that company, those are grounds for being fired, all right? Three penalties. Penalty number one came the very first month that I worked there. I was supposed to be the representative for my department. And I was in this big meeting. And so I'm sitting there, I'm supposed to be taking notes. Instead, the guy who's giving the meeting had like, if you're familiar with wrestling from back in the day, Hulk Hogan was this big wrestler who had a handlebar mustache that came down to here. So the speaker kind of looked like him. So instead of taking notes, I decided to draw this guy. The drawing came out amazing. But when I got back to my department, you know, the supervisors, I, you know, David's going to lead us through um, what the fire chief was talking about regarding um, fraud. And I'm like, oh, I, I was supposed to be taking notes. And I was like, well, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any notes. He's like, well, what were you doing? And so I showed him the drawing. That was my first penalty. Second penalty was, um, my cubicle area, I would take like little post-its and I draw stuff like happy faces on the post-its and then I put them inside a plastic cup so that if you walk by, the plastic cup had a happy face or whatever other expression. And my God, I think I had about 40 plastic cups around my cubicle with drawings on it. And obviously that was a penalty. So that was number two. Number three, I don't even remember what I did but I remember sitting in my supervisor's office and he was telling me basically we're gonna have to let you go. So I was like, whatever, you know, I don't, at this point I didn't really care too much. Um, and again, wrong mentality, wrong attitude to have, but this is where I was. Well, here's an interesting thing about State Farm. There was a man who came by, his name was, well, I probably shouldn't say his name, but I never spoke to this man ever in all the time that I worked there. He walked by, saw me and said, can I speak to you for a minute? And I'm thinking to myself, well, I already got three penalties. So I don't think I'm allowed to get a fourth one. He's like, has nothing to do with that. Just like, come with me real quick. So I sit in his office and he starts telling me that he's this great salesman. He loves insurance. He's been in the industry for God knows how many years. And he's like, do you know why I'm so good at it? Because I I'm, I am completely dedicated to this. He's like, I am so passionate about being able to help people out in their time of greatest need. He's like, and that's why I'm able to shine. He says, I don't know anything about you other than you like to draw. But what I do know is you don't belong here. He's like, this is, the, this is your only opportunity, this is your only life. This is the only opportunity you get to do the things that are important to you. Do you really want to spend the rest of your life working in a place that's just paying your bills, where you're just surviving? He's like, you're not thriving. You're not where you need to be. He's like, you need to look within yourself and find that thing that, that motivates you, that gives you hope. And, oh man, this dude, this man, What a blessing that he came by, he came when he did. And um, I thought so much about what he told me and what decisions I had made, and more importantly, where I wanted to be. I had never thought about where I wanted to be five, 10, 15 years from that point. And that was the first time that I really started to think about it. So what I did was I started looking for um, opportunities in the animation industry. Um, also during that time, worth mentioning, I ended up getting married, um, which was another scary thing. But getting married was, you know, again, another great thing that happened in my life because now I had, I had that extra support. Um, 
January 2008, I landed a uh, illustration job at this company, gaming company. And I felt like, oh man, now things are starting to come together. Got married, I'm happy. I got a new job. I left State Farm. I'm drawing, I'm doing what I want. And things just couldn't be any better for me. Boom. Next year comes, I get laid off. I'm like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. So here we are again, back at square one. So, I'm, you know, that's one thing about the art industry and any other industry is probably similar, but specifically the art industry, you have to be very, very specific with where you want to be in terms of what industry do you want to be in? If it's animation, um, then you have to build your network with anybody that you talk to, anybody that you associate with should have something to do with the animation industry because most of the jobs that I landed, I landed because of relationships that I made with other people in the same industry. So here I am freshly fired again, well, not fired, but laid off this time. And um, just trying to contemplate what am I gonna do next? In the process of contemplating that, my first daughter is born. And that's when I really started to decide where, what is my, like, what is my goal? What is it that I want to achieve? And one of the things that I've always wanted to do was work for myself. Um, I just felt in my bones that I could do it. And I had a long talk with my wife. We talked it over and she supported me on it. So what I decided to do was just go full steam ahead and just start looking for freelance opportunities. So I took to Craigslist. You may or may not have heard of them. Um, and I landed this, I landed several, you know, freelance jobs. I started making some money. It was a great feeling. Um, but there was one job in particular that changed my life. Uh, it was an animation gig, quick one minute animation project. I did it, I handed it in and I thought I was done. Um, well, it didn't actually work out that way. That same year, my son was born. So now I have, you know, a lot of great freelance opportunities coming. I have two kids. Um, I'm starting to feel the pressure a little bit more. And then this happened. So remember I told you I did a Craigslist job? So I did this Craigslist job and the guy calls me back. And he says, hey, my boss saw your animation and he wants to talk to you. So I'm like, all right, cool. Um, I showed up like this, t-shirt, shorts, you know, I didn't, I just thought it was just a casual meeting. Turns out it wasn't. It was in a board meeting in an executive suite and there were about 15 guys in suits. And this, this is not good. So whatever. I walked in. I loved it. We're partnering with the LAUSD and with Apple. Basically what they're trying to do is replace textbooks with iPads. And the first round of testing, they want to create a lot of animated content. And basically we want to know if you have the ability to create 300 animations in the next year. Now, let me tell you something about animation, traditional animation. One minute of animation can sometimes take a week to two weeks to do, just one minute. So, you know, we're talking about a lot of work. And where am I? I'm in my small condo with two kids working from my living room. He asks me a question. Do you have the bandwidth to take on this job? Again, very similar situation when I walked out of the office in, in Warner Brothers, when my mother called me and I had to make a decision. Am I going to stay or am I going to leave? What am I going to do? I was faced with it one more time. And I said, oh, absolutely. I have the bandwidth. My team, we're ready to go. You know, um, give me some deadlines and uh, send me some scripts. I'll send you an invoice. We can get started. He's like, perfect. Um, draw up a, a simple contract and we'll pay you the deposit. I said, it sounds good. I walked out that office and I was like, I almost had a heart attack because I, I didn't know what to, like, I didn't know what to do. 
So I had to hire people. I had to put a budget together. I had to figure out a way to make this thing work. I had no clue how to do this. But by making the decision of believing in myself, that was what kickstarted my career. Because I ended up working with Pearson for a good, um, I think five years, for about five years, we ended up working together. Great, great, great opportunity for me. Another thing it taught me was the importance of education. Up until then, all of my animation and all of my artwork was just artwork. I mean, the cultural stuff had an education value, some educative value to it, but I wasn't actually trying to teach anything. So by seeing how they did it, I absorbed that and decided I wanted to use that in my work. I wasn't sure how, but I knew I wanted to use it in my work. March 2013, that was my last child, I promise, no more babies. Um, my daughter was born, and by this time I was very, very comfortable, I was very relaxed, and I started to get a better idea of what I wanted to do. Um, 2014, the Pearson contract ended. Now, while it might seem like, oh man, that was a horrible, horrible thing, um, it actually was a good thing because it was a transition period. And that transition was my oldest started kindergarten. And I wish I had a picture of, I don't know if you can see it very well, but um, right here. She started kindergarten and everybody was happy. This is the best thing in the world. And I think it was like two months into it, the principal called me and told me that there was an incident uh, that somebody said something racial to your daughter. And oh, I was ready to start flipping some chairs around. But, um, you know, I went in and I found out what happened. Basically, it was another young boy said to my daughter that he thought she wasn't beautiful because of the texture of her hair and the color of her skin um, and that he doesn't like brown skin people. So that put me in a very awkward situation because I knew that this type of racism and prejudice existed. I just didn't know it existed at such a young age. So that threw me off. Um, so now my wife and I find ourselves talking to our kids about this at, a, at such an early age. And then I started paying attention to the school, the curriculum. What is she learning? What is she seeing? Um, who are the heroes that they're highlighting? Everybody was European. Nobody was a person of color, except for February. Um, I had a problem with this. And what I decided to do was, that's when I heroes of color. The objective of that was to highlight the achievement full of different ethnic backgrounds so that my kids could see the value in people like them because school is not going to give them that cultural education. In fact, many schools aren't even equipped to handle those conversations. So I wanted to make sure that I was preparing my kids to defend themselves verbally first. And I started doing a series of videos um, and it was just, it was, it was great. It was a great way to get conversations going in the house. Um, the following year in April, a good friend of mine was attending this business summit called Patal. And he's like, Dave, I don't want to go by myself. Just come with me. So I go and, you know, not really thinking too much about it. Um, there was a poetry session, you know, they had like these different workshops and I like go to sign up and the lady's like, oh, sorry, you, you, you can't come in. You're not on the list. I was like, oh man, you know, I, I really wanted to get in there. It's like, you know, is there any way you could just let me in? She's like, sorry, not on the list. So I was just hanging out by the door, just thinking like, I gotta get in there somehow. So when the lady turned around, cause somebody asked her a question or like directions. So while her head's this way, I snuck in and I just sat down, took a seat and just acted like I belonged there. You know, I was doing what everybody else was doing. They were grabbing some snacks, I grabbed some snacks. And you know, the, the workshop was about to start. They closed the door, I was like, yes, I'm in. And um, it was a poetry workshop. And the facilitator said, I want everybody 
to write a poem about something meaningful that has happened in their life. So I was like, okay, I got it. I wrote something down and he's like, I need a volunteer to come up and read it. Nobody raised their hand. I was like, I'll do it. So I get up and I start reciting my poem. And I was talking about heroes of color. That was what my poem was about, about the series and about the impact that I hope it made in the um, elementary school system. I read it and he's like, that was amazing, great job. After the thing is over, a woman comes up to me and she says, hey, I really loved your poem. Let's exchange business cards. I don't have mine here right now, but I gave her my card and I have like a little cartoon character on it. And so when she saw it, she's like, oh my God, this is beautiful, I love it. Um, she's like, do you have any children's books? Again, I did not have any children's books. I had no intention of creating a children's book, but I saw another opportunity. So believing in myself and knowing that I did this the last time when Pearson gave me this, asked me if I was ready to do their you know, 300 animations. I told the woman, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm working on a children's book right now and I'm almost done. She's like, you know what, send me the manuscript. I want to send it to a good friend of mine. Um, she works at Scholastic. I was like, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me. So I was like, yeah, no problem. We exchange info, I run home, and now I have to put something together because I didn't have anything. So I put together, this was my original idea, Little Heroes of Color, um, and I send it to Scholastic. And I'm thinking, this is a direct, contact so my chances are looking really really good well i sent the i sent the manuscript and it was rejected uh, like almost immediately i was crushed because i felt like you know if ever you're gonna get a job it's gonna be through a hookup so this was the ultimate hookup and it didn't go through so you know i was going through a period of feeling sorry for myself and when i snapped out of it I learned about this program called the uh, Black Public Media Incubator Program. It's basically like, think of that TV show, Shark Tank. It's like a Shark Tank, but for filmmakers, Black filmmakers specifically. And just as, as I learned more about it, I was like, oh, this is great. So what happens is you get in this program, they give you workshops for two weeks, and then you come back and you pitch on stage to networks, like all the major networks. And if they like your stuff, you win the competition, you can get a check anywhere from 50 to $150,000 towards the creation of more episodes or film or whatever your project is. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do it. I filled it out, mailed it in. I had a really good feeling, got rejected. I was like, oh man, I'm striking out. So at this point, I'm feeling like just, I hit the bottom of the barrel. You know, things seem to have been going really well and then all of a sudden this happens. So I wasn't really sure what to do, what moves to make next, but I always I always kept in mind, every time things didn't work my way, which was almost always the case, the only reason I was able to continue is because you see this game board, you see how we're moving along in the game pieces? The ending, I knew what my ending was. I knew where I wanted to be. So that's why despite obstacles, despite the rejections, despite all the negative stuff that was thrown my way, I didn't let it deter me because I knew where I wanted to go. So I decided I was gonna take my films, the short Heroes of Color videos, and start submitting them to film festivals all over the country started submitting them and I started winning and I started getting first prize for this, first prize for that. It won, well, it, now it won seven times, but uh, it won all of these awards. So what that did was that helped boost my confidence and my belief in myself. And I put a little thing on the bottom that says, you are what you have been waiting for. Oftentimes we're saying to ourselves, if I had this one thing, everything would be perfect. Or if I had that perfect house or that car, or if I had this job, my, everything would be perfect. And we're always waiting for something else or on somebody else to help move forward. But take the time to realize that 
that everything you need to succeed is in here. Everything you need. I'm not saying that you're going to have all of the answers to everything, but you don't need to have all the answers. You just need to be resourceful enough to find somebody who does know the answers. You know what I mean? So after I submit this, I start getting super excited about like my, my career and I'm starting to love education so much that I decided to go back to school to get my master's. And um, so I'm working on it, you know, working on the master's degree. And this opportunity comes up in New York. There's a uh, called the Schomburg Center. Very, very big, you know, uh, they preserve a lot of the literature, statues, artwork for like African-American culture. And they started hosting a comic book festival. That year, uh, I called to find out if I could get a table. You have to pay for it, you know, it's not free, they're not giving it away. And I was thinking about it, but then I was like, I saw something even better. I saw that on Saturdays, they have a panel where you can get on the stage and either show a movie or whatever. Like I was like, I wanna get on that stage and show some of my films and talk to the audience. So I reached out to them and I said, look, if there's any way that you can get me on that stage, even if it's 10 minutes, just give me an opportunity to talk to my audience. Cause it was junior high school level. That's, that was my target audience for my videos. So she says, look, I can't promise you anything. Okay. You have to buy your own plane ticket. You have to put yourself up in a hotel, which wasn't necessary because I'm from New York. So my family lives there. Um, and we're not, and we're not going to pay you anything. I said, I don't care. Give me a stage and 15 minutes and I'm good. Why was I so persistent on this? Because I knew, again, the end of the game board, I knew where I wanted it to be. So a funny thing happens when you start planning five, 10 years from now, this is my main goal. What you do to actually make that happen is you start working backwards. So everything you do right now, should help help you get just a little bit closer to that goal that you set for five or 10 years from now. You understand? So I knew that being on this stage was just a little, gonna help me get a little bit closer to my ultimate goal. So I get on the stage um, and gave me 45 minutes. I showed all three videos. I had an incredible conversation with the audience. They applauded me several times during the conversation or presentation. And I mean, I was like, I was on cloud nine. I couldn't believe what was happening. And when I walked off the stage, Channel 11 was like, hey, we want to talk to you. We want to give you an interview. Sounds good. Uh, the New York Times, hey, we love what you did. We want to write up a story on you. I'm like, great. Um, so I'm starting to get all this publicity, but I didn't really know what to do with it. So my mentor, uh, which is another topic we'll talk about on another day, but my mentor um, gave me some advice. He said, now what you want to do is you want to use that to your advantage. All of that publicity, use it to your advantage. Call Scholastic again and tell them, hey, just want to show you what I've been up to the last two years. Um, got on this article, got on the New York Times, I was in the news. And when I sent her the clip from the news, I was wearing a t-shirt that had all these little cartoon characters from the Little Heroes of Color. I don't know if you can see it, or well, you probably can't see it from my camera view, but um, I had all these little cartoon characters. And so the lady from Scholastic tells me, hey, we love the artwork, it looks gorgeous. We should talk because I think there's a potential for a book from what you just shared with me. She's like, send me your manuscript. Okay, check this out. I sent her the exact same manuscript from June, 2016. Nothing changed, but this time she loved it. And I'm getting the contract and I got the deal with Scholastic without, without an agent. If anybody is publishing industry, you know how difficult it is to eat the door and got in because I didn't give up, you know? And if you have a contact, if you have a, a, a network that can get you to that contact, you have to work it. Just keep working it and don't give up because interesting things can happen. Um, since all this great stuff started happening, it just became too much. So I decided to take a break from 
my master's so that I can focus entirely on what my big dream was. During that time, the public media in 2016, they had another uh, they had another event and they said, hey, would you like to try out again? So I tried out and this time I got accepted. And this was just like, okay, now things are starting to go back in the direction that I want them to go in. And the training actually started in uh, January of 2019. It was in New York for two weeks and I learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned most was you always have to take a chance on yourself, like always invest in yourself. You know, while I was doing this training, off, all, almost all the time, the facilitators would say, I want somebody to come up right now in front of everybody and pitch their project. Without rehearsing it, just come up and just pitch it. And every single time I would raise my hand. It got to the point that whenever a facilitator would say, is somebody willing to come up? Everybody turned their head and looked at me because they knew I was willing to go up. And everybody would be like, wow, David is fearless and he's so courageous. Not true. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified every single time I raised my hand. But what I realized was every single time I raised my hand, I was strengthening my pitch. I was improving my pitch. So I was using it as practice. That's what it was for. Um, the actual award, I mean, the actual pitch ceremony was gonna take place in April. In between that time, I ended up pitching an idea to uh, College of the Canyons. I wanted to do a freelance business class. And I had been cultivating that relationship since 2016. That's another long story. It's a funny story, but I'll share another day. And all of my efforts worked out. I ended up getting the gig. It was an extremely high paying job. Um, it was a three day workshop that I did and it was remarkable. It was great. It gave me again, more confidence. April comes around, fly back to New York with my three kids and staying in my mother's house. And I'm like, well, mommy, today's the day. I do my pitch and I get up and I'm getting ready to do my pitch. And something happened that really scared me. So here's a quick thing. Anytime you're pitching or presenting on a stage, if you're trying to sell something, there are three things that you always wanna keep in mind. Number one is um, trust. You wanna establish trust as quickly as you can with your audience. Logic, whatever you're saying needs to make sense. And emotion. You wanna be able to share an emotional story that will make your audience feel for you. Now, I'm not saying a sad story, right? Happiness is an emotion. So prior to me getting up on the stage, I'm like, okay, I got it. I know what I'm gonna say. I will say this joke, I'll do this. Another guy before me gets up and his story was so like personal and emotional that while he was giving it, he started crying. So I was like, oh, that's a pretty strong emotion. And then the audience started crying. I was like, oh man. And then the three judges started crying. Everybody's crying. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this, that's going to be really difficult to top that emotion, you know? So he gets off, everybody has their tissues and they're wiping their noses. And I get on the stage being, you know, the person that I am, I open with a joke because I figured um, laughter is an emotion. It's just as strong as crying. And everybody could use a good laugh right now. I don't even remember what the joke was. It wasn't really that funny, but it was perfect timing because everybody needed to release, like they needed that. So that was my emotional hook. I already got them with my emotion. Um, and then I threw two or three other emotional jabs in there. But long story short, I continued with my pitch, ended up, I won the competition and I came home and I told my mother and my kids were there looking at me and it was just like, it was the most incredible moment of my life. All of this was coming because of decisions that I made to believe in myself. I got rejected by them, remember in 2016, but I didn't let it stop me. I kept moving forward. Um, 2019, the book is published by Scholastic. Everything's starting to work out. And actually, 
I've been working on another book called The Freelance Hustle, which is a book which talks about the business side of art. So for anybody who's an artist and wants to learn the business side of it, that's what this book is about. And this came out literally the, 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 right ne the next month, January. So here I am, January 2020, and a lot of things were starting to sort of like happen for me. Book, uh, book signings, you know, launches, like all this great stuff. And then, oh, I, I went too far ahead, sorry. All this great stuff started happening. And then that's when the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hits, it put me in a really, really bad um, position because a lot of those book signings and a lot of those events were canceled. Um, so I lost a lot of money and just, I felt, I felt defeated. I felt like, what, like, what am I gonna do? And that next slide, March, 2020, what I decided to do was I decided to interview other artists just to see what they were doing. Like, how are you dealing with this situation? How are you making a living? And I, I forget what the series was called, but I interviewed like eight different artists, like great artists, you know, respected artists. And everybody shared some different insight. But what I was doing was I was preparing myself because I wanted to keep teaching, uh, you know, the business side of art. Um, but I knew it was going to go virtual. So I needed to get comfortable doing it virtually, speaking in front of a computer. Like I can do it now, but before I was, it was so uncomfortable. And I bought the lights, I bought microphone, I bought the headphones, I got everything all, spent all this money. And that week that I did those interviews, I messed, every day I made a huge mistake. Like just anything that could have gone wrong, went wrong. But I kept going, I didn't stop, I kept going. And it's gonna end here, the presentation ends on this slide, but what that represents is basically a lot of colleges, a lot of elementary schools started reaching out to me because they started getting familiar with the work that I was doing. And, and I were, wasn't just doing presentations in, in colleges about freelance. I actually started doing workshops for elementary school kids talking about race. And the idea came from just some random woman I saw on Instagram. She was hosting some workshops on talking to kids about race. And she's like, I'm using three books. And my book was one of them. So I thought to myself, my God, what a brilliant idea. I can do a workshop and use my book. You know, it's my story, so I can probably give a different perspective. So I started doing that and just doors started opening. You know, I, I've updated this presentation to be more relevant to right where we are right now. And I'll just say this, I'll end it on this note. Um, none of this, none of this would have been possible if I wouldn't have believed in myself, if I wouldn't have had the hope that everything's gonna turn out okay. You know, it's one thing to just hope and pray and be positive, but it's another thing to actually take action you know, and have a plan. And when you do that, sure, you're gonna mess up. Sure, you're gonna make some mistakes, but you keep that goal in mind. And I, I promise you, if you want it bad enough, you're gonna find a way to get it. Um, so that pretty much concludes my presentation for my art um, career. And I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'm all glossy and sweaty now, but if, uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions that you'd like to share um, or ask, please feel free to do so. I'm more than happy to chit chat. Sammy, thank you, David. That was amazing. Sammy, do you want to take over and ask the questions from the Q&A? Yes. So our first question is, who is your greatest inspiration or who was your greatest inspiration throughout this journey? My mother, um, my mother has always been my greatest inspiration because she came to this country from the Dominican Republic with with um, not not speaking. She still doesn't speak English, 
and she had five boys. She raised five boys by herself and she could have given up several times in her life and she didn't, she kept going. And I just knew that if my mother was able to raise five boys in a crime ridden area in New York City during the height of the crack epidemic and none of us got arrested, none of us got hooked on drugs, none of us had any bad VCOs, then I had no excuse. If she can do it, I can do it. So my mother has always been and will always be my biggest inspiration. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question says, uh, which kind of educational characters did you make for your job with Pearson? Uh, <clears throat> so Pearson project was teaching um, in that time, they were going through seeing what was called Common Core Math, Common Core Reading, Common Core whatever. So the videos were explaining how Common Core was done, whether it's a math problem, reading or writing, you know, sort of like the logic behind it, because it was kind of confusing. And when they approached me, it, I believe it was four characters, two, uh, two white characters, and a Latina character, I think. And I forgot, I don't remember, but I do remember saying, well, where's the Asian character? Where's the African-American character? And why are you following these cultural biases and stereotypes and making the Asian kid the smart one with math and the black and the Latino kids are always the ones who need the help? Why is it that way? Why don't you flip it the other way? Why can't the Latina be the one teaching everybody or the black kid teaching everybody? You know, so the educational value, of course, they were teaching that math and that English, but the educational value that I got from it was um, standing up and speaking up, you know, because a lot of times we see this happen and we say nothing or we do nothing about it. And so here I had an opportunity to change the perception that kids were going to have when they are learning, you know? So it was huge. Pearson thing was like huge. I built so much confidence. Um, and, and yeah, so that was really the educational value of it. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, that was great. Thank you. Um, the next one is, what do you think was the most important lesson that led you through this path? Most important lesson was to Remember that persistence always overcomes resistance. Persistence overcomes resistance. Keep that in mind. People are gonna push against you. Life is gonna push against you. You're gonna have you know, obstacles that come your way. But if you persist, you keep moving forward, you will be able to get through it. Trust that you will be able to get through it. Um, that was my biggest lesson in all of this, is persistence always overcomes resistance. Um, the next question is, what do you love most about art? What I love, there's several things that I love about art. Number one thing that I love about art is it has the power to bring people together regardless of what language they speak, regardless of their background. You can have people from five different countries, 10 different countries stand in front of a piece of artwork and all appreciate it the same way. So it has the power to unite people. That's one of the things I love about art. Another thing I love about art is I used to be very, very shy. And art gave me my voice. Art enabled me to speak and not be shy. Um, so it, in essence, created who I am. You know, I was able to speak through my artwork. And when people look at my work now, it's a reflection of what's important to me. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jimmy. It's now six o'clock and um, I promised everybody oh. this would be an hour. <laughs> so I don't want to, I don't want to take too much time, but um, this was awesome. And we have really enjoyed hearing your story. Um, and as, as the mother of an artist, she's actually going to go into art history, but um, I totally appreciate hearing the ups and downs and, 
and the business side of art should should definitely be a part of every art program <laughs> and how to how to market yourself which is what you did so uh, i'm so impressed and i'm so happy that we were able to have you tonight thank you to everyone um, for being here and um, thank you again david we i look forward to working with you in the future um, everyone, this Wednesday, we are Thank hosting you. Enrique Villanueva, um, a psychotherapist and an author. And if, for those of you who habla español, this is a perfect opportunity to um, figure out how much you understand because he is going to do the whole thing in Spanish. We will have translators who are translating into English. Uh, this is the first time we've done it like this, and I'm super excited about it. So uh, for all of you in AP Spanish, this is a great opportunity or anybody at our flag schools, great opportunity to listen to the native language and um, and, uh, and, and and in its truest form. Um, and then also save the date for November 6th. We're partnering with the public library on Dia de los Muertos. Adelante Latinos and our clubs will have um, an ofrenda. Um, and there's gonna be like 12 different ofrendas, I believe. So we're super excited about that. So please put that on your calendar, three to six. We'll also have student performances there. And thank you to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Gallimore. Thank you, Mr. Eredira. Thank you, Aurora. Um, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. David, we'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a great day.